Uh, welcome to our second talk of this uh, Quantum Algorithms Day. So um, I welcome uh, Toby Hoag from the Center of Quantum Technologies, who's going to talk to us about uh, how to teach AI to play Bell non-local games using reinforcement learning. Um, as for the other talks, uh, please post in the Slack channel and I will pick up uh, and put questions to Toby at the end of the talk. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, a recent paper we uh, recently put on archive. So I'm going to show you how we used um, deep learning to teach um, AI to play well known local games. So we want to teach it how to optimize and, and, and violate well known local inequalities. And the method of choice we're using is a deep reinforcement learning. This work was done in collaboration with my collaborators, Kisha Bharti, Vladko Vitwa, and Leon Schokbeck from uh, in Singapore. And I would also to point out um, our recent review we wrote about this field. So actually this is part of a way larger field where basically recently there was a lot of interest in how to, you can use quant uh, machine learning for quantum foundations. So for about this field, we basically wrote a recent review in ABS. And if you have time, I urge you to check it out if you're interested more in this field. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the basics. Okay, so um, what is machine learning? So Arthur Samuel gave a very, general introduction of this topic. Um, so according to him, machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So the key point is basically that the machines is able to achieve a task without explicitly being told how to achieve this. So it basically it will like achieve, like learn and, um, and acquire the path to, to solve this task on its own <clears throat> without being given an explicit algorithm how to achieve this. And of course, um, um, people now define basically three main concepts or basically say um, um, three main um, areas in machine learning. And you can correct us more or less about like how much data you're giving to the machine to learn. So I'm now going to explain this from going from more data to less data. The first one is so-called supervised learning. So in this set, the machine is given labeled data so to give you a very concrete example is let's say to give the machine images of cats and dogs. So you give them basically an image and a label. So you give them an image and saying, this is image is a cat. And the other image is, is it, for example, an image of a dog. And you say, this is image is a dog. And you give this to the machine and you show the machine now many of these examples. And now the machine space is supposed to learn from these kind of um, images. And after you show the machine many of these images, you will now show the image a new image, which the machine has never seen before. So basically you show something that machine has not seen before and you give you now an image of let's say a cat or dog, but there's no label to it. Now the machine basically is supposed to give an answer. Is this a cat or dog? So for this kind of task, the machine now basically needs to generalize from the data it has already seen before and um, identify something um, and basically generalize like what is the key concept of a cat and dog and then apply this to new images that have never seen before. And you can now make this um, you can now have the machine learn with less data. So in so-called unsupervised learning, you would give the machine, let's say, unlabeled data. So in this case, what you show the machine is, let's say, again, with the same example as I showed before, with cats and dogs, you would show an image of cats and dogs, but there would be no label. So you just showed in the images without saying what is actually what is shown. And the machine has now basically the task of distinguishing these two classes of pictures. So basically you would show the data and then the machine basically has to basically recognize that there's some basic features about cats and dogs. And then it will basically identify like that one type of um, image you show for cats and the other type of image you have shown is, is dogs. And finally, the, the set of machine learning with where you give the least data is reinforcement learning. So in this, there is no data at all. So you give the machine no data at all. Instead, the task of the machine is to do learning by doing. And how he's doing that? Basically by getting reward and punishments. So um, to give you a, like a, um, a very common example is like say, um, if you want to have the machine to learn how to play a video game. So this has been recently done very routinely. So in this case, in, in the context of reinforcement learning, what you would do is you would um, have the machine take the control of some video game. So we would show basically the, the screen and you would give the machine the control over the, the, the controls. So it would, let's say if it's a race game, you would give it like the controls over the, the race car. 
And then basically you would have the machine just play it. So the machine would just then basically control the race car and like play the game. Of course, initially the machine doesn't know at all like what it's doing, right? So initially it will just randomly play around, but then basically you will teach the machine by just giving rewards and punishment. So if let's say machine is doing well, like it, it achieves a good high score in the game, then you give a reward saying you've done well. If it's done not so good, you will punish it and saying this was not good what you've done. And from this, the machine will now learn. And this concept is very similar to like, like now babies initially learn how to, to, uh, to learn to live in this world. So initially when they're born, they know nothing about this world. So they will just play around, like interact with the environment. And then basically um, from the interaction with the environment, they will, uh, uh, let's say also getting like, uh, like instruction feedback from their teachers and their parents, they will learn how to, to master the world. Okay, and in recent years, there has been tremendous advances in machine learning. This was mostly driven by deep learning. And deep learning means you try to use neural networks as function approximators. So for example, the task of classifying cats and dogs is now given to a neural network as a kind of way of, of approximating this function, given a certain image of a cat or a dog, what is this image? Is this a cat or a dog? In fact, this has been done doing so well that it, it, it was able to beat the world champion in the board game of Go, which has been believed to be a nearly impossible task. So deep learning works um, in the following way. So the most basic building block of a deep learning, you have a, so this is called perceptron. So um, in this case, it works at the following. So you give in an input. So this is shown on the bottom left image. So you have the inputs. So inputs are just real data. So real data could be, for example, like um, uh, just let's say the, 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 uh, the values that belong to an image. And then you multiply these inputs with, sorry, you apply, multiply these inputs with the weights. This is called here synopsis, but you can just call them weights. And the weights is also real numbers. And these numbers can be adjusted. So these weights are like free parameters you can optimize. And basically what you do, you multiply now the inputs with the weights. Each input has its own weight. And then after summing over all these, these numbers, you apply a nonlinear function. This is happens inside this thing called neuron. And this is then basically your output. Okay, so now if you take many perceptrons, you can now generate a, a neural net. So the idea is, again, this is shown on the right side. This is a basic example of a neural net. This in case is a fully connected neural network. So you have your input layer again. So basically where the, the new, your numbers come in. Then you have these, um, these lines, which basically these lines are supposed to be weights and they lead over to the neurons in the so-called hidden layer. So instead of one neuron as before, you have now, now many hidden layers. Many, sorry, you have many neurons. Okay, and then you basically do the same thing. You multiply the inputs of the weights, then sum up, then you apply the nonlinear function. And then you can repeat this game. So you can have many, many layers. So here in case you just have uh, one input layer and one hidden layer, but in principle you can have as many hidden layers as you want. And, and then finally you have then a final output layer where basically you get a result. So for example, like the identification, whether this image is a cat or a dog. Okay. And now we're going over to, um, where you're going to apply this kind of concepts onto. You're applying this on Bell non-locality. So I'm giving a very brief introduction. Um, the basic idea of uh, in Bell non-locality is basically you have uh, two parties, Alice and Bob. And these parties, um, they, they share a, a state. And they have one part of each state. So there's a one state and they give them like each part of it, one part of it. So Alice gets one part, Bob gets the other part. And Alice and Bob are fast separated. So they, they kind of communicate directly. And now what they do is they perform measurements. So they, they perform some random measurements. So Alice performs measurement X, Bob performs measurements Y, and they choose them randomly. And they basically then perform these measurements on the state they, 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 they have. And then they get some outcome, A or B, which depends on the measurement they, they performed. And after doing many, many rounds of these measurements, they basically calculate now these statistics. So basically the probabilities, so given some measurement X and Y performed by Alice and Bob, what kind of outputs they got a and B they got, and with what probability. And if you assume this model is locally realistic, so meaning the state the share has um, is run by some hidden variables. So, um, so the state they share basically, um, is, and the outcomes they measure is determined by some hidden variables that are basically selected beforehand. Then the kind of probability distribution you can generate is given by this function here. 
However, in quantum theory, if you assume now quantum theory, um, the measurements performed by Alice and Bob are not uh, are now um, POVMs, and the the state of share is some density matrix. And it turns out that quantum theory can generate statistics which are not possible in a local realistic model. So if you basically find some probability distribution which is not possible to be realized by local realism, then, then you can say basically quantum theory is violating local realism. Okay, and, if, and basically in this field, the question is like, how do we um, find such, how do we find the correct probability distributions? And how do we find, can we show this kind of violation? Okay, in order to do that, basically what you have to select is, you have to select these measurement operations as well as the, the quantum state. Okay, this is very easy in the most basic example, CHSH. So as again, the question is like, what is the best quantum state? What is the optimal measurement setting? Here, it's very easy. In this case, we have two parties, Alice and Bob, each has one qubit. You choose the state as a bell state, a thing of bell state. And the measurement that you can choose is some kind of, is a, is a Pauli measurement. So in case of Alice, you basically measure in the Z and X basis. Bob measures either in something which is rotated 45 degrees relative to Alice. And then you can um, take the, the, the outcomes of these measurements. So you basically, you calculate the, the expectation values of these operators and you take the expectation value of that. And it turns out if you assume um, a hidden variable model, then this kind of um, expectation value will always be smaller and equal than two. So in a hidden variable model, nothing, it has to be smaller and equal than two. And um, however, it turns out if you choose this quantum setting with these quantum state and with these measurements, you get two times square root of two. So you violate um, the spell inequality, proving that quantum theory is beyond local realism. Okay, so whereas this is very easy in the CHSH scenario, you can construct more complicated by inequalities. And the question is now, how do you find in these more complex settings, how do you find the, the, the best measurement settings and the best quantum state? Um, if you actually happen to know the optimal measurement settings beforehand, then there's an easy way to do it, which has been recently demonstrated by Dong and Ding to work very efficiently, even for, for large system sizes, for many qubits, for example. It turns out basically you can calculate the, the state and the violation. So what you do is you, you, you write down your, your operators that you measure upon. Here, for example, this is the, you can write these kind of operations and the, the expectation value as a Hamiltonian. So interpret as a Hamiltonian. Here I've written down as example for CHSH, but you can write this down for, for even more complex spell inequalities. So after writing this down as uh, this, uh, the, this as a kind of Hamiltonian, you calculate then the ground state and the energy of said Hamiltonian. And it turns out that the ground state is the, the state of maximal relation and the eigen ener eigen energies you find is the, is the maximal relation. So this method basically works very well to find um, the, the optimal validation in case you know the correct measurement settings that Alice and Bob have to perform. But in general, this is of course not known. So generally you would not know what is the best measurement setting they have to perform. So this is now open question. How do you find the optimal measurement setting as well as the quantum state both together? Okay, so how you find basically the better, the optimal measurement angles that you have to perform. And the second question people now often ask themselves in, um, in in this field of quantification is like, how do you um, solve n non-local problems? The problems I talked so far were uh, Bell scenarios. In this basically you have um, non-locality with only one shared state. So there's only one quantum state, Alice Bob share. But in principle, you can have n locality where you have basically n sets of independent states. So this is something we routinely find in quantum networks as well as also in, let's say in quantum um, in entanglement swapping. So to give you a very concrete example, um, in the case of two non-locality, you have three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And Alice and Bob share some state, and Bob and Charlie share some state. And each of them have like Alice and Bob, there is a state that has some hidden variable, if you assume localism and Bob and Charlie as well. And Alice and Charlie are completely independent. So only Bob is performing measurements on, on both states. Alice only performs measurements on, on her own state and Charlie as well. In this case, the probability distribution is a bit more complicated than before. And um, basically I've written down here. And these scenarios turn out to be non-convex, meaning standard optimization methods do not work well in these kind of scenarios. So it's very difficult to find um, how, what kind of quantum states would violate such, uh, such non-local inequalities. 
And um, so for example, like this trick I showed before with the Hamiltonian would not work in this case at all. Okay, so now we, we want to address these two questions. So how do we solve spell scenarios in case we do not know the optimal measurement settings, as well as like how do we can solve these n non-local problems. And here we propose to use um, deep reinforcement learning. So in our approach, our goal is basically to find um, n optimal angles, which parameterize the measurement settings, as well as the quantum state for our and for, to violate our inequalities. And we interpret now this, um, this problem as a game, as a sequential game. So we're going back to our this initial concept I showed you with reinforcement learning, where basically you try to control a video game or where you think of this baby playing around. So this works as follows. So you, you have given a state S. This S is a state that basically describes your, your information about the system. So in our case, for example, it would be these um, angles that parameterize your measurement state, your measurement settings, and your quantum state. And then using giving the state of, this, of the system, you would choose the next angle that basically um, defines the system. And then you repeat. So you're given a state, you would choose the next angle. Then with this new information about the angle, you would then update your state. So you will go there from a state as zero, given the angle theta one, you go to state one, then you choose the next angle. And this uh, additionally gives you new information, which you then use to determine the next angle and so forth. And you repeat this n times. And after that, you have your n angles that basically make up your system, make up the, your, your quantum state and your measurement settings. And now the idea is that we, that we, um, that we use neural networks to choose the angles. So the idea is the neural network would take in this, this information about the state and return you the, 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 the angle for, for the problem. And in principle, I basically the, our concept is basically shown below in this kind of setting. So we have a neural network and our quantum system. And the neural network is basically taking in the state. It will then, um, then process it using these neural hidden layers. And at the end, you can see this, this thing called a policy layer. And this basically policy layer will give you a, a distribution, which basically from that you sample the, the next angle. And then you calculate the inequality and you use the information, the inequality to, to change the neural network weights. So after getting all the angles, you would calculate the inequality. And then using that inequality, you would then train the neural network. So how this works is basically, the inequality gives you a measure of how well has your system done. So how good was your result? So using that information, you would basically then punish or improve the neural network. And this is done by adjusting the weights. So the neural network is, is handled by these different weights. And depending on um, whether we have a good or bad, let's say we have a, uh, we found a very good violation, then you basically reinforce our neural networks and say, okay, these kind of um, weights are good, you've chosen. Whereas like if it's a bad result, you would punish and force the neural network to change the weights to, to, to find something better. And this example, we used a method called ectocritic, where basically there's two, two neural networks that basically work conjunction. One is basically, it's the called actor, which basically chooses the next angles. And a critic basically, which evaluates the, the chosen action so far, which basically like um, checks like whether you have gone good and bad. And these two work together. So the actor chooses new settings and the critic basically tells you whether it was good or bad. And they basically help each other to improve. So this method has been routinely used to master video games. So, um, okay, so um, with this kind of setting, uh, we now applied it to, to our proper intent, namely um, inequalities. Okay, so in this case, we basically we train both measurement angles as well as the quantum state to be optimized. So as the first demonstration, we use the CHSH scenario. And in this case, you can um, see now the training. So on the, on the x-axis, I show the number of epochs. So how many training episodes have been there? And on the left side, you see the rewards. So basically what it was in quality. And the blue line basically shows the, the output basically what the, uh, the output of the neural network and what kind of inequality it, it, it got. So the, the blue line here you see is the average output. So you repeatedly run a network and then you average over the results over a given epoch. So initially you can see that the inequality is close to zero. So that means initially the neural network has no clue what's going on, right? It just was just initialized with some random weights and it has no clue what is quantum mechanics or what is what is actually supposed to do. So initially we just do something at random. Right, we just try out random things. 
And then after trying random things, it will basically, it will start getting feedback, right? It will tell like, okay, this was good and this was not so good. And from then on, it will improve. So you can, initially we start basically from nearly zero watt, but then it improves steadily. And then eventually we reach the, this red line, which is the classical bound and cross it. So meaning now we're basically in the realm of um, quantum mechanics, we see actually a proper violation. And we see eventually like the system converges to the top blue line. And this top blue line is basically the, the um, and the top line gives the, the quantum bounds, so the maximum possible violation. And we actually converge towards that line. Okay, so this works very nicely for ZHH. And um, we also apply this now this, to this non-convex scenario. In this case, a two local scenario, where basically our standard optimization buffets still work well. And we, we again say the same features. So initially, this new network is doing very badly because you're just trying random things, but then it quickly improves and is able to converge towards the, the, the maximum possible quantum violation. Okay, so can we this also now used to address like um, settings with um, which are a bit more complicated. So in turn, you can actually extend the CHSH to the many qubit case. So you can do this with many, many qubits. And the inequality is only characterized by one and two qubit correlators. So this is something very easy to measure. So the inequality is shown here. And basically you have, and this inequality is only made up of sums of um, of one qubit and two qubit operations that act on the quantum state. And these settings, it's an um, important question, like how do you find the quantum state and measurement settings to violate? And this has been routinely applied already to, um, to, to, um, to um, quantum many body systems. So we are proposing uh, that you can also use this as a kind of um, variational answer for kind of for NIST devices. So the idea is as follows. Um, we would um, use prepare a state variationally so in, in kind of in, in routinely available nowadays in quantum systems, let's say what IBM Google has, you can apply, you have an array of qubits and you apply quantum gates on it. And normally the kind of gates that you're available is like single qubit rotations. Here, for example, we choose um, rotations around the y-axis parameterized by some, some angle alpha. And then we have like an array of CNOT gates, which, be, which basically entangle the system. And then we basically repeat the structure. So this is a very common answer. It's, um, people nowadays routinely use on um, NIST devices and have been demonstrated widely by IBM and by uh, Google. Okay, with this ansatz, basically, we now repeat this a few times. And then finally, after preparing our state, we um, perform some measurement in some basis. And of course, we do not know the measurement beforehand, so we parameterize the measurement as well. So this U mesh you see here is basically the parameterization of the measurements that you have to perform on the qubits that you then need to, to calculate your inequality. Okay, and then we basically, we, we run this kind of circuit and after and you can calculate the expectation value of the inequality, given basically this kind of prepared quantum state, variation per constant, as well as these variationally defined measurements. And then you um, you, you calculate the, the, um, the, the, the inequality you found against the number of epochs. And again, we see the same features. So the blue line you see here is the average reward given out by the machine, uh, by this setup. Initially you see the reward is zero because the machine is just trying things at random. But then again, it starts learning and then it quickly improves. And actually it manages to converge against the, 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 the maximal quantum violation. And again, um, Right, and we did this um, using our deep deep learning approach. Okay, and this was actually performed for three layers. So this answers we used had uh, used uh, three layers of CNOT gates. Okay, and this is actually something which is um, can actually be scaled to any size. So um, the idea is like very simple because it, as I showed, you can do this routinely. It's been heavily translated. You can do this on this quantum processors. Of thinking beyond, actually, you can also do this for the n locus n non locus scenarios I introduced earlier to use on quantum networks. So you could think of this of being used in the quantum internet where you have many parties and they have they share some complex entanglement. You could basically extend this this approach as well to this kind of systems. Then you basically you would use the, the you prepare, optimize the state, the measurement angles by using the measurements you performed on the quantum computer, and then you would optimize the next set of state and angles using a classic computer. And if the bound is violated, so of your given inequality, either band inequality or like an uh, n local, non local kind of inequality, this would basically be a demonstration that there is something inherently quantum going on there because you can only 
give him some assumption. Basically, it's a definite proof that that the system is indeed quantum, and there's some quantum processing going on in there. And this inequality actually is often known for any number of qubits. So these many-body inequalities I showed earlier, you can define them for any number of qubits, and you know the classical bond as well. So in this case, it would be a very efficient, scalable benchmark for NIST devices, which could be extended to um, for in the future if you have hundreds or thousands of qubits. You still would know like what is the, the 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 bound you need to violate in order to demonstrate that the system is indeed quantum. So with this approach you would have a scalable benchmark for to be used in this devices. Okay, and with this I would come to inclusion. So basically, we showed that you can use deep learning to find measurement settings in quantum states for band inequality, and also non-convex and local scenarios, as you would see in let's say in quantum networks, and it would be as a benchmark for this devices. And again, this is basically our papers and our recent view on this larger field of quantization machine learning. Uh, also flashing here some um, some other recent um, research I've done, but I have no time to talk about. If you're interested, please check it out as well. And with this, I'm coming to my conclusion and I thank you all for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Toby, for a very uh, interesting and comprehensive talk about a very interesting um, area to work in. So we have had, uh, some questions coming in on the Slack. So I'm going to work through them now. We've got a couple and I, I expect more mm. will come in as we get to the end of the talk on the YouTube channel. Uh, so from Thomas Aimer, a fundamental question. With mm. this approach to brackets and unsuper unsupervised learning, you kind of reproduce Born statistics uh, or in the case of, of Bell, uh, encoded statistics. Um, but the machine will only be able to detect violations of Bell. So it's not really understanding it. Uh, it's like in the Go case, somewhat a, a magical hyperdimensional hyper matrix, which is based on uh, lots of cases and thus somewhat encoding knowledge, but in the form where a normal person could not deduce the rules, or is there an ability to extract the knowledge? Uh, so he's touching on the wide problem, how to make machine learning mm. results trustable or understandable. Uh, it would be great to be able to extract machine generated knowledge somehow to help humans understand how the machine came to its conclusions and this confidence or understanding. So basically a uh, kind of uh, interpretability mm. of uh, your reinforcement learning method is what he's asking about. Yeah, of okay. course. Um, so if I, um, so you're asking about basically the deeper understanding. I agree. So, um, so far, um, it's very difficult to extract like um, a deeper meaning of what, um, what it has learned. So for us, we, we do not have a proper understanding of what neural networks actually do inside. So it's very difficult to so basically, the network is just a bunch of weights. So in the end, it's very difficult to extract some physical meaning out of it, or like whether to see like has they learned something more fundamental and how to extract this kind of things they have learned. Um, but there's approaches where um, people are able to. Um, so there was recent um, studies where you can actually have um, uh, reinforcement learning approaches learn more complicated um, extract physical meaning out of settings. So they could like. Um, extract like physical laws by looking, giving it like, let's say, data of the movement of the sun around the earth, uh, sorry, the, the movement of the earth around the sun. They could extract like um, the fundamental laws and reconstruct like the, the uh, Kepler's law, et cetera, from, from this kind of data. So there's ways how you can make, basically uh, extract physical meaning from these kind of, um, from these machines. Um, so this, yeah, this is definitely a very important question, like how you go deeper than that, how you, Try to find physical meaning within this. So far, we've used it more like as an optimization approach, um, but these kind of methods hold the power to to gain the deeper physical understanding. Okay, thank you very much for that. And so we've we've also got a, a slightly more concise question, which is a, a bit more mm -hmm. uh, direct. So uh, Joel Klassen has asked: Is it mm -hmm. correct to think about this task as performing a search for entanglement uh, for an entanglement witness and uh, can we be confident that this problem is not in general somehow equivalent to a computationally hard problem? Um, in this case, I think, yeah, you can interpret the band inequality as some kind of entanglement witness. So if you, if you violate the band inequality, you definitely know there's entanglement. So you can think of it as, as an entanglement witness. Um, is this equivalent to a computationally hard problem? Um, This is a good question. I'm not sure if it's generally hard. Um, I, I don't think it, this is, I don't know why I, uh, 
Okay. I think in general, it's not easy to find the, the exact results. So I assume it's, it's a hard problem. Um, okay, so uh, yeah. thanks very much. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So I, I absolutely agree, yeah, yeah. So I think in general, it, it's a hard problem. So, um, so you have the usual problem of finding the, the optimal state. It maybe may not scale very well if you're unlucky. So if you go, let's say, to hundreds of thousands of qubits, it may not scale. It's, um, finding the optimal state may not scale very well. So it may be very difficult to violate the classical boundary principle. OK, thank you. So that actually uh, comes on to one question I had, which is to mm. do with scalability. So I mm. notice uh, you, you mentioned that uh, potentially this would be a useful technique. Mm even as you scale up to, I think you said tens or a hundred, hundreds of thousands of qubits. Um, so do you, have, do you have an idea about the scalability from the results you have so far? Uh, no, we didn't study the scalable in principle. We just know that the inequalities exist for any number of qubits. So in principle, it's scalable, but um, we have not actually checked like how our ansatz scales. Um, then you also have the usual question, like how do you choose the best ansatz? Um, so you have to would have to try like different ansatz and see what's the, the best to choose from. Okay. Uh, so, so, yeah. Okay. So this is something for for the next um, for the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's all the questions we have, and that's all my mm -hmm. questions as well. Uh, so I should say there's there's sort of applause and, and like emojis, things like that. So I think the talks. Thank you. Um, been well appreciated so just to, mm -hmm. to thank you again from every on behalf of everybody who's been watching uh, thank you very much